Oh, there's one I want to pull back in here too. Uh, where did it go? All right, okay. So this is a good case of something. Uh, so this was a patient who had a double lung. Oh, I'm not, am I not? Am I showing my screen? Yeah, a double lung transplant, and I. Um, and the, the post-operative course was complicated by an air leak. And you can see what, despite tube drainage, there's still not huge, but there's these ongoing pneumothoraces. You can see, um, and they're sort of loculated, which you often see sometimes with these um, transplants, they get adhesions and all sorts of things. And typically they put two drains in on each side. So uh, we did a CT scan looking for a source of an air leak. And so the, I think the important teaching points is, of course, you could have a parenchymal injury that can lead to an air leak, but the first place I always look is the um, anastomosis. And so we see the right upper lobe anastomosis looks pretty good. And they do do a telescoping um, sort of orientation. Okay. It's not uncommon to see a little bit of an overlap like that. But right, right down there at the bronchus intermedius, there's a little gap, and you can see it communicates with the pleural space as I scroll through that. So that is the presumed air leak. Now, what else is kind of cool, there's a couple of other interesting features we see in these patients, is it's not uncommon to, with, a, with a clamshell to have a common pleural space down where they, where they open the sternum up. So the pleura communicates so that the air leak will come out on both sides. And also the pericardium, because it's an intrapericardial, uh, sometimes the pericardium is disrupted anteriorly, and in this case, the pleural spaces communicate with the pericardium. And then we have communication also with the chest wall uh, because the way they do it, you can get a disruption of the endothoracic fascia, the intercostal muscles uh, when they open up the chest. So it's a pleuro, bilateral pleuro pericardio chest wall fistula here. We definitely have what looks like a bronchopleural fistula at the uh, in bronchus intermediate anastomosis. And just to make things more complicated, he had some infection or aspiration post-op and that was all getting better, but you can see he developed some cavitation in the left lower lobe. And I wasn't 100% certain or what uh, when I was looking at this case with, uh, you know, we've been imaging for several days if there was any actual communication with the pleural space on this side or not, sort of indeterminate. Yes. The drain's right there. It sure looks like it, but sometimes there's a very thin membrane. So um, kind of a complicated mess. So they did a, they, they did a bronchoscopy and... You can see there's the suture line. There's some blood in there. Uh, if we go a little further down there, right here, you can see a little hole. And that was what we were seeing on the um, CT scan. There's a little hole right there, zoomed out a little bit. So there it is right there. So that's the little anastomosis. And this is this little like uh, granulation tissue that forms there. It wasn't an infection or anything like that, but there was just a little breakdown in it. So uh, they put a little stent across it and he's doing much better. So bronchopleural wow. fistula. So that was kind of fun. Um, here's a case Julie sent me. Uh, let me find the radiograph. So this is a patient who has a history of um, extra uh, nodal marginal cell lymphoma that involved only spleen. So back in uh, a long time ago, had no lung involvement, but then uh, had presented with, uh, let's see, where's the new radiograph? some symptoms and you can see there's some nodules in the lung, a mass on, on both sides there. And so at that time I had a CT shortly thereafter and you can see these irregular nodules, this one more of a mass, quite large, uh, air bronchograms, which you'll notice all of these have air bronchograms. This one looks like lung cancer. It's spiculated, it's retracting the fissure. Uh, some of them have halos of ground glass around them, but in all of them or mostly all of them, the airways are relatively preserved. And yes. so this was biopsied and is, rec is recurrent lymphoma. Uh, not so low grade as we often think of these, these particular lymphomas, um, but it, yeah, just recurred in the lung and presumably in the malt tissue, which explains the association with the airways. Um, and I've not seen one cause this much mass effect, or I mean, this much consolidation, but I, I, I did have a recent case of a diffuse large B cell lymphoma that had big masses. Uh, so, um, but the, and then sometimes they do have ground glass around them and that's just less dense lymphoid tissue. But these are, they, these look more like lung cancers just in the way they're behaving with the sort of re retraction of the fissures and stuff. But this is yeah. uh, a nice case from Julie. Yeah.
The last one I showed you guys was one that had many years of recurrence of lymphomas and involved many organ systems chronically over many years from CNS to breast tissue to an extremity to the lung. It certainly happens that way. It can be very chronic and recurrent. Yeah, lymphomas are just weird. They do all sorts of crazy things. Particularly low grade. Yeah. Marginal lymphomas. Okay. Yeah. Now I have a trio of, of cases that are related um, in that they all have the same imaging pattern. So this was a patient who was, I think he's in his 70s, um, was on uh, daptomycin for a soft tissue skin infection, usually used to treat MSSA and stuff. Um, and you can see on this, and had a, just a, a, a dry cough. And you can see on the radiograph, we've got some nodules and sort of this mass-like area of consolidation on the left. Uh, they did a CT scan as well, and the dates are off on here, but that's fine. And you can see the um, peripheral consolidation uh, and these peripheral nodules. Uh, many of them have air bronchograms, not all of them, uh, but they're very discreet, and they have sharp margins, most of them, and they cross bronchovas bronchovascular segments, like a nice example. You've got three different airways coming in, and it's sort of this confluent mass. Yep. And so this is a nice look for an organizing pneumonia pattern, um, which, of course, daptomycin uh, is, seems to be, um, I see a lot of organizing pneumonia from daptomycin. It's uh, one of the more common antibiotics to give you lung reaction. So, um, and then with the treatment, it gets better just by stopping the drug. And some patients require steroids. So that's one. Uh, I'm sorry, that was the mesalamine. I got them backwards. Okay, this is the daptomycin, but the patterns are the same. Uh, this patient, uh, the other patient had uh, was on mesalamine for inflammatory bowel disease. This patient uh, presented with this radiograph, and you can see multifocal consolidation, nodules, masses. Um, CT subsequently done shows uh, more extensive disease. So here we actually have some crazy paving, um, but same sort of sharp margination at the lobular margins. And I find that a very helpful finding. Uh, with organizing pneumonia, because typically with edema, hemorrhage, and infections, you often uh, get fuzzier margins, whereas this, for whatever strange reason, tends to be more um, confined by some natural anatomy. And then you've got some stuff around the airways and the vessels as well, little patch ears of ground glass. This one, you got a nice sort of uh, trying to arcade a little bit, sparing some lobules, discrete lobular sparing. So this would be more extensive, but also an organizing pneumonia and the drug was stopped and given some steroids and you can see there's dramatic improvement in just about four weeks um so not not everything is is, is an infection and then the third case is uh, is another case now this is one i know i think howard you've shown some examples of this patient was on pembrolizumab uh, which is often used uh, it's treated a lot of cancers but particularly we've seen it in a lot of squamous cells and um the first scan was at time point one and this was just done for surveillance. And you can see the patient was a former smoker. There's some emphysema and developed this peripheral ground glass opacity and sort of these nodular band-like areas of consolidation. Air bronchograms are preserved. Um, very discreet margination with the lobules. You see there's a lobule right there and it just abuts the septum and the vein. Crosses several bronchopulmonary segments. Uh, another good look for organizing pneumonia. So at that point, Drug was stopped, patient was given steroids, and you can see it gets a lot better. It starts melting away. And that's what we typically see. And it can take a while. This was about six weeks later, but definitely getting better. Now, the drug had been stopped at this point. Um, steroids were then tapered, and the patient came back for follow-up imaging. And you can see, and I'll put them up side by side, that the, um, the lower lobes continued to get better. A lot of this perilobular thickening and all that started to clear up. But if we go north, and this is the newer scan, there's new areas of organizing pneumonia that weren't even involved in the first place. And you see this perilobular thickening, consolidation, and discrete nodules in the same exact distribution. They become confluent and give you this arcading appearance. Um, and so the only thing that had changed is the steroids had been tapered. So this is an, another known um, uh, thing that occurs is, is you, the, the, the injury can recur even though the drug is long gone, uh, when steroids are tapered, in some patients they're tapered too soon. Um, and this patient got a, a, a full course at a, an appropriate time period. Um, 
And but there's there's about 15 percent of patients who may recur after steroid tapering. So they either require longer term steroids. Some of them may require um, at least suppression. But uh, even with the drug gone, it can recur. So just Boy, that, an example, that's all. drug wow. and organizing pneumonia. Um, and it, we, it's it's I think it's an underrecognized pattern. We see it all the time. And um, we can't always figure out what it's from, but I would say in the era of immunotherapy, we're seeing this almost weekly uh, in our cancer population. Plus, we see it, of course, this time of year with influenza. It can be a post-flu-like um, syndrome with you know the, the so-called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. So many of those patients report a viral prodrome, so it could be a response following an infection. It could be a manifestation of infection. Uh, we've seen it connective tissue diseases, um, inflammatory bowel disease, but by far and away drugs. And so that's, that's an important one. Um, go back. And then just quickly, I'll show one more, um, and then I'll turn it over to you guys. And I've got plenty more. And this was a case um, that I posted on Twitter the other day, but it's just a great example uh, of a, something we don't see very often in adults. And this is an osteum primum atrial septal defect. And you can see there's the defect right near the, uh, the, the where the two septa come together. And it's often associated with endocardial cushion defects, uh, trisomy 21. They can get uh, problems with their mitral and tricuspid valves. This seemed to be in isolation, um, but you can see the, 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 the contrast different uh, attenuation. There's denser contrast here, and you can see the sort of mixing there and the absent septum. There was a cardiac MR as well, but I didn't save it. it the images weren't, it wasn't, didn't turn out as well as we hoped it would, um, but just, some we don't come across very often. How old was this patient? Uh, he was in his, oh, that's the wrong list, let's see. He was 56. Wow. Yeah. And his radiograph looks like pulmonary hypertension, doesn't it? Shunt vascularity. That's it. Not, not, nice. not the worst looking radiograph. I mean, they're little juicy no. muscles, but yeah, I'm kind of surprised it went this long, to be honest. I would have expected a lot more. Um, I mean, that's a pretty sizable shunt. Yeah, it makes you wonder how different people's right heart and pulmonary circulation remodel and adapt differently. For sure. For sure. Yeah, very impressive. Oh, this seems yeah. to be an incidental planning. Perhaps he has a pleural effusion of some etiology that he's being evaluated for. I don't uh, connect up the pleural fluid with that necessarily. No, I think it's related to his heart disease because I mean this was all he was ref he was coming from cardiology. This wasn't incidentally detected. They were looking for a shunt. Oh, I see. Yeah, but it was an outside it was an outside study. Okay, um, I have got a few more, but I'll save them for the end if we have time. All right. So, which one of you wants to go next? Go ahead, Travis. Okay. So I have a few that I can show here today. One, a couple of them that have path proof since last week, but since I've got, been gone, a couple of them are older ones. This is one I've been waiting for a few months. This was an, an outside study, and this was they they were admitted, and I I reviewed this CT, and. It's interesting because you, you see there's small effusions and then there's a lot of inflammatory stranding in the mediastinum and in the subcutaneous tissues anterior to the sternum, there's some small little nodes in the, in the mediastinum as well. And then there's this weird, looks like a soft tissue mass either arising from or involving the, the left thyroid gland or maybe even a hematoma because some of this is heterogeneous in attenuation. But you know, when I saw this instantly, I wanted more history because I was worried first and foremost that this patient either was bleeding into their mediastinum or, or mediastinitis in the acute setting. And you can see there's some mass effect on the trachea. What's interesting was that they had a neck CT from a few days before, also from the outside hospital. And you'll see when I scroll down on this, that I was also a little nervous because all of this stuff was getting worse. In, in a fairly short time frame over the period of three days. But they still had this weird thing inferior to the thyroid. And on this one, it looks like it's probably separate from the thyroid, even though maybe some vessels from the thyroid veins there uh, supplying it. But anyway, called up the clinician. The patient was, was asymptomatic, except that they had hyperparathyroidism, 
which we thought was unusual. And I think one of my fellows read this with me, and we were wondering if this was going to be some sort of parathyroid adenoma or even a parathyroid carcinoma. The other thing with this rapid development, I was wondering if it could have been lymphoma or just maybe this thing bled. But they did an ultrasound and didn't fi actually find anything to biopsy. So they didn't do anything at that point other than follow up with ultrasound. Subsequently, they did find something that was inferior to the, the thyroid gland, didn't actually take it out at the time and just schedule her for surgery. And they just took this out a couple weeks ago. And this was like a three or a four centimeter mass that turned out to be a parathyroid carcinoma rather than just an adenoma. And so it's just a weird look. And I still don't know because we never got cross-sectional imaging if this thing had bled in between these studies or was bleeding or, or what all this was, maybe third spacing due to this fluid. She wasn't really acting infected at the time, so it wasn't mediastinitis. And they hadn't tried to do a biopsy or any sort of intervention at the outside hospital. So I don't have any other explanation for this, but this is a weird case that just turned out to be a parathyroid carcinoma inferior to the thyroid gland. Yes, so. there's some odd things because there's pleural space abnormality and then subcutaneous soft tissue abnormality anterior to pectoralis muscles and it's all together, yeah, exactly. all together strange. Yeah, it was hard to, you know, hard to put it all together. But, you know, we were, yeah. I was worried even though they said on ultrasound they didn't really see anything there, that this looked like a discrete mass that was persisting there. And probably, I, got, I don't know, maybe our, our best guess is it may have just bled or maybe this is all just third spacing. But... It's a case of a confirmed parathyroid carcinoma. Wow. I, Travis, I like your hemorrhage theory because it's awfully bright. Yeah. That's what I was thinking too. I don't, I don't know, but it, it, it was three months like since then. It, it, it's taking up space and it just looks. Yeah, and this was, an, yeah, it was an infiltrative mass and they, it actually had positive margins when they took this out. But yeah, it was three months later that they went to surgery. So things had cooled down by then. Right. But I, I, I bet it probably bled. So, but we'll never know, but it is a case of, of parathyroid carcinoma. Now this is, an, this is an interesting radiograph. And this is a 70 year old man and I have to admit, I think this radiograph is kind of hard to interpret because the, let me, let me stop sinking here. You know, I, he, has a, he has a chronically dilated megacolon, so that's beside the point. And I think this is one of those things that you have an abnormality that's so large and we frequently see things in the region or, or elevation of the diaphragm, you know, that you wonder, could this be eventration? I'd argue probably not because it doesn't look like we have colon in the right upper quadrant. So it looks like the, the liver is still occupying this space here. This is more posterior. You have a nice hilum overlay sign here. And then I think one big clue is looks like it's just, it's, it's extending into the azagosophageal recess and, and exerting some mass effect here. So I think that, you know, all of these com in combination, you'd say it's most likely a mass or could conceivably be a loculated effusion. Now, also the the vessels in the right lower lung are undisturbed, and they're surrounded by aerated lung. Part of this hilum overlay, or even further out, yeah, you're saying for the right, one can see right lower lobe vessels by virtue of the fact that they're coursing through aerated lungs. So it's not an intrapulmonary process in that sense. That's a good point too, right? So it's posterior. So yeah, it's either. A big hernia, maybe an elevated hemidiaphragm, probably not for the reasons I just said, or or some sort of mass or or pleural effusion that's just huge. Now yes. I'll put this one, I'll put up this prior radiograph, because this was this was done outside. And this one I think is, you know, in retrospect, seeing what is now seen there in 2019, back in 2017, I think especially on the lateral, there's an abnormality. And Howard, do you see or Jeff on the lateral? Um, well, there's, you know, abnormality related to the azagoesophageal recess. There's an abnormal interface there yeah. that corresponds with yeah. opacity behind the heart on the lateral projection. Yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of interesting right here, right? You have, yes. it's, it's projecting through the left hemidiaphragm because it's, there's gaseous distension of the colon just extending upward. So yeah, it looks like there's a middle mediastinal mass here. Yes. You know, looking at those. And I think this radiograph is really helpful when you look at the CT because we're 
talking to the surgeon before they did anything on this, and you will see that this is, in fact, an enormous mass. It's not, it's not of the diaphragm or of the abdomen. This is of the, I think, of the mediastinum or maybe the medial pleural surface. But as we know, in, when you see things that get this large, it's often hard to tell where they come from. The thing that was confusing about this, and you can see it, it, it displaces the esophagus, no surprise right there. When they, the, the outside biopsy was just mesenchymal tumors or mesenchymal cells, NOS, you know, they didn't get a specific histologic diagnosis. And then I read the surgeon's op note and he said it was adherent to and involving the wall of the esophagus. And it made me wonder, could this just be the world's largest lyomyoma with all of this dystrophic calcification? I think whenever I, I always tell my residents, whenever you see something really big in the chest, especially in an older patient, you have to think about a sarcoma, you know, just in general. And it turns out on, this was, it was completely encapsulated, even though it was near the esophagus. And this turned out to be, at least when you see this stuff right here, this was a dedifferentiated liposarcoma fully encapsulated, but very large, very few fatty elements there and fairly rapidly growing too, considering that was 20, the end of 2017 when it was there. And now it's at least, I would say tripled in volume since then. But yeah, that's what this turned out to be. So. Hmm. Okay. Wow. Yeah. 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 I think the, I think this radiograph, the findings, as you pointed out, both on the PA and the lateral view, maybe, you know, hopefully prospectively someone might make that you know diagnosis but you've got the the confounding factors here too with this massively distended colon which i think can cause distraction because maybe somebody might think this is just a tortuous aorta although you know you could see the aorta here and it shouldn't sweep that far anteriorly yeah yeah very impressive this is one, and we've seen a few of these, and I know I've shown a case of one that was biopsy proved. And this is a, a patient from our ILD clinic, and this is from a couple of years ago. And so you see they, this is for evaluation of fibrosis. And of course, the approach on all of these now with the new Fleischner or new ATS guidelines, and we have definite UIP if you see the, the uh, honeycombing. And you can argue, is there honeycombing here? You know, is there a little bit of honeycombing here? Back when this was done in 2013, when he had the biopsy, you know, it was considered a possible UIP pattern, which now would be probable UIP because he has enough traction bronchiectasis. He's an older man. So the surgery confirmed that he had UIP and he's subsequently been diagnosed with IPF. But the reason I show this is, of course, there was this, the biopsy was done outside and they were worried about a cancer here knowing that patients with UIP have a higher incidence of cancer. But I think we see a ton of patients with UIP that also have intrapulmonary lymph nodes. And they're you know, often, I think we see them more in patients that have inflammatory processes or you know, something ex exciting or insulting the lung, especially if they're a smoker. And I think this is one where you, know, you can see this is a pretty typical you know, triangular appearance to this along the fissure. And even on the axials, you can see how it's fairly flat. I think, you know, some people might think that intrapulmonary lymph nodes is a pretty mundane topic to discuss. But as I said, we biopsied a few of these. This was taken out at the other place at the time of the surgery. So it's actually a confirm a path proven intrapulmonary lymph node, um, which is one of the reasons I thought it was it was fun to include right here. So uh, I don't yeah. know because I, I know Jeff and I have talked about this quite a lot in the fact that, you know, I don't even mention them anymore. Or I may just throw it in the body of the report, especially if they're lower lobe or along the fissures. And here you can see on their subsequent CT where this, the staple line is, where that was. That was one of the, the surgical lung biopsies they did. And he's had a little bit of progression of his fibrosis with peripheral reticulation, a little bit of worsening traction. And then again, I don't know, this is near a staple line. It's not really, it, at this point, it is not important to, you know, whether or not it's honeycombing beforehand, you could kind of go either way. And I think this is one of those ones where you have inter-observer variability. But right there, I'd probably say there's three, at least three air-filled cysts. And up, up north, I think probably even more. But at least now with the de-emphasis of honeycombing, it helps in a lot of these cases. 
Yeah, that's interesting. So we think they took out the lymph node just because they happened to the open lung biopsy in a particular place. And well, then, I, I don't, I mean, in the, in the report, because this was done outside, that they were worried oh. about it, right? Because oh, it's a patient who's so, a smoker who has fibrosis. But I, I okay. think, the, yeah, the point is, I wouldn't be that worried about it just because of its triangular shape. And I've, I've shown another one that, that was biopsied a few years ago because it was enlarging. It was about a centimeter. But it still has that typical triangular configuration along the fissures. Right. Yeah, I too would not have raised a concern about that if I was reading that initial e exam. Yeah. Here's one that uh, I'll just show. This is one that I came across. Well, it was recently excised. This radiograph is from the outside hospital, and I, these are pretty. Uh, these are pretty straightforward cases, but I think this is a nice example. And you can see there's something that I think some of my residents want to say this is hyler on the right. It's in the region of the hilum, but of course, remember that the right hilum is lower than the left hilum. You can actually see the right hilar vascular opacity here on the lateral view, and it's a little slightly lateral. So if it is in the hilum, it's it's up along the, the farthest, you know, superior and lateral aspects of the left hilum. And this is a 54-year-old man. I think this was just an incidental uh, preoperative radiograph. And if anybody saw Brent Little's talk at STR on malpractice in radiology, he was presenting some data that preoperative radiographs are one of the highest, you know, highest rates of, of suits in chest radiology. And so they're ones, his point was that you shouldn't blow them off, that they're actually the ones that you're most likely to fall into a trap and miss something. But of course, this wasn't missed and further evaluation was done with CT. And you can see that this is in the right upper lobe. And you see that there's some coarse calcification in it. It's very well marginated and round. And you know, the first thing you think is, is hamartoma raised maybe the possibility of it being a carcinoid, except I think when you look at the vessels, usually a carcinoid, you should see arising, or sorry, look at the airways, you see it should be arising from the airway rather than from the vessels. And they actually went in and excised this, and this is a path-proven hamartoma. So I'm not exactly sure why they why they excised it because he you can see here, but I think he was referred to a surgeon, so they decided they could take it out. But it's a nice example of a path-proven hamartoma with findings that we typically expect to see. And I think a lot of the hamartomas too. We don't often see a lot of macroscopic fat. There's maybe one voxel here I think where it was minus. 119 you can see there but it's more the calcification the other the other appearance of it but certainly carcinoids could have calcification too and i'll show one more if i can even remember what this one is um let me see here oh yeah this is a fun one this is just a, a quick radiograph finding and i'll show you the uh the PA view. Do you guys see anything? Um, it's, um, hold on. Let's see if I can Is window it a little. What did you say, Jeff? It's a bit dark. Um, yeah, let me see for the other. These are both older radiographs. So now I'm obviously on this one, I'm trying to window. This is just a fun one because this was not this was not seen on either of the radiographs, but I think it's because you know it's always a reminder to look at the lateral because I think now the oh, finding jumps now out. I, now I see it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, posterior. So, of course, yeah. One of the places we always look for blinds or you know one of the blind spots always have to remember to look you know behind the behind the ribs and of course behind the diaphragm and you can see it. I stop. Let's stop sinking that. Yeah, and you can see it's right there. Oh, okay. Very well circumscribed, but I think this is one of the places you always look on the lateral view. Now, fortunately, it didn't lead to anything that it wasn't called on either of them because it happens to be just a large calcified granuloma. I think it has a benign pattern of calcification to it. And moreover, there's, you know, there's smaller calcified granulomas and some calcified lymph nodes in the left hilum but easily a place that a, a small lung cancer could be missed or something else if you're yeah. not looking at the lateral. Yeah. So, Travis, that's very typical of what we see with histo. 
I'm, but I guess in your neck of the woods, it's Coxie. Yeah, you know, I I don't remember this guy. I can't remember if this may have been a VA patient, and we were having the discussion because, yeah, and th that was the next thing I was going to say is I looked at the spleen and the liver and didn't see, uh, didn't see anything. You know, usually we don't see just single or solitary calcified coccidioidomas. Right, but, but I know what you do. I bet it's yeah. and I love the targetoid calcification. Yeah. This one is that too, but it's almost got a, a lamellation around the periphery. I, I think it has both. It has like, yeah, little mm. lamellated calcification there and a little bit more discrete calcific, you know, targetoid yeah. in the middle. Yeah. So nice. that's just a fun one, but yeah. just a, a place that's an obvious blind spot on laterals. So I will stop there. All right. Thanks, Travis. Okay, first one is going to be a follow-up. Um, I showed this case a couple of weeks ago. The patient presented with a pleural effusion on the right side, the diagnosis of which uh, was elusive for a time. And then I showed you folks the CT that was really striking from the point of view of the presence of interstitial lung edema, particularly in the form of peribronchial fluid cuffs septal lines and also in relation to the fissures subpleural interstitial edema um, very extensive in the right lung but there's also the same finding in the left lower lung so pleural fluid and findings that in a context of a patient with a known cancer one would potentially suggest lymphangitic spread of tumor i then told you that the workup eventually resulted in the discovery of abnormal blasts in the bone marrow biopsy so this is the first bone marrow and while in terms of numbers the pathologist suggested while this does not quite meet the criteria for aml they were obviously very concerned about it so i will show you that in terms of a follow-up because i suggested that this was really a case of a manifestation of blast cell accumulation within pulmonary lymphatics and that there was an association between that and and the imaging findings so here is the follow-up ct so this was done fairly shortly thereafter so that is let's see the timing of things 215 versus just a matter of days so this is 20th and the findings <clears throat> are pretty much the same perhaps even a little bit worse. So there is a lot of interstitial edema, maybe also some alveolar edema as well now in the same area, but still quite asymmetric. Because of motion and sharpness, I like to think there's still maybe some septal lines in the left lower lung, but we don't see them as well as before. But these findings are still present. So he was discharged with a presumptive diagnosis of that but with a plan for a repeat biopsy. And the repeat bone marrow was done soon after he left the hospital. And I thought I had the number there, but the second bone marrow biopsy showed a definite increase in the amount of blasts in the bone marrow biopsy, and they made a definite pathologic diagnosis of AML. So I think everything fits for sure. He definitely is going to be treated for AML. He meets the criteria for that, at least in terms of the bone marrow. And I do think that he does have this <clears throat> manifestation of AML. So here is that article that I showed before, but it's sort of this notion that this is really quite unusual, but at least from these pathologists' point of view, one can sometimes get an appearance representing interstitial edema, lymphangitic spread of tumor, in this case from leukemia, rather than the usual adenocarcinoma that we see. So he definitely has that, I think. I don't have a biopsy of the lung, but it's a strong presumption, I think. This one over here is just the one that I was asked about uh, by email today. So I'm inclined to suggest a particular diagnosis and I want you guys to tell me if you would say the same thing. 
So someone discovered what they described as a mass in the left chest wall. And this is an incidental imaging observation because as a patient with end-stage renal disease, he also has bad liver disease, and they were evaluating him for, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Oh, maybe not, sorry. They were going to evaluate him for possible transplantation. So someone obviously saw that. So let me show you that this has been present for a long time now. So, whoops, that shouldn't happen. Let me bring that down and show you that, show you this. So we have, in terms of time, just over one year. So on the right-hand side is before, and it really hasn't changed. So let me just scroll through that versus that. And I'm certainly inclined to say this is very characteristic, I think, of elastofibroma dorsi. There's opacity there, but there's a lot of fat within it. There are a couple of tiny calcifications, but mostly we have the combination of sort of the muscle attenuating tissue and fatty tissue. The location's great beneath the serratus anterior. Would anyone have any reservations about simply saying that's what it is and not to worry? Of course, it hasn't changed in a long time. Only thing, there's two things that bother me about it, Howard. I don't think it's aggressive. Um, I agree it looks like one. It's not in the classic location. They're usually more uh, inferior to the scapula, just like right below the tip. And I've never seen one push through the intercostal muscles like this. I agree. And then, so could this be a, with the given the little calcifications? Could this be like a like a slow flow vascular malformation, like a venous malformation? And that's uh, those are flebolus. Hmm, I didn't think about that. Or, well, uh, what about a, a hibernoma or something weird too? Just brown fat and yeah, I, I showed a hibernoma. Calcif- I've not seen one look like that. They they are often um, there's more fat attenuation in them. And they're more homogeneous. This clearly has some denser soft tissue. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, whatever it is, I think it's benign. But that's just my other thing. I've just not seen. I've not seen yeah. the uh, uh, elastofibroma dorsi in this location, and I've they I've never seen one do anything. I mean, that intercostal muscle band with yes. the endothoracic fascia should be pretty tough. So yeah, so it's a little higher than usual, and this bulging, this mass effect pushing inward. Is a bit odd, right? Yeah, I, okay. I don't know what it is. Yeah. But I, I think it's a reasonable thing to consider. It's just in a weird location. Because um, it you're right, it does have fat and what looks like muscle in it. So if it is that, it's a, sort of an unusual variant of it, or a slightly right. unusual presentation yeah. of it for the reasons that you mentioned. It's, yeah. it's interesting too that I mean, while they are deep to the serratus anterior, this person has much you know, larger serratus anterior muscles than we usually see in these patients. It makes it look weird too, because usually it's older patients that may have a little less muscle mass. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I agree with everything Jeff said. Okay. So I'll suggest it's likely benign, of course. It's a bit odd for elastofibroma dorsi. Maybe it's a variant of it. A calcium, I don't think I've seen one, because we don't see this very often, of course, I don't think I've seen one in calcif- with calcifications in, but the calcifications are very small too, so it's hard to know what they are exactly. I've been looking more to see if I could sense more tubular opacities for sure in it, but it's hard to say, isn't it, whether it's some kind of vascular lesion rather than that. I don't know. And there's nothing on the other side since no. often the elastofibromas it can be ba- can bilateral. Be, yeah. Let me shut this one up. Can you bring this one up and let's see if we can. Maybe more inferior. No. 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 Hmm. Okay. Curious. All right. So if I ever find out what that is by some some means, I'll let you know. All right. Can I show you guys a case uh, that Julie shared with me and see what you think? Oh, yeah, show that sure. one. I just yeah. had a moment to look at that. That was pretty odd, too. Yeah, I'm curious if you think anything else. So, this is a, a patient with known asbestos exposure. And uh, here, I'll show the soft tissue windows. Has this, you know, has pleural thickening, pleural calcification, plaque. 
And this has been a known effusion for many years, and it actually had contracted quite a bit. And you can see it's got this rind that's calcified. And so the patient then, about five or so years later, let me show the, uh, let's see, I have long windows, I thought I did. Um, I don't have, and these are, I can't window these the way we'd like to, but developed what looks like some junk in the left upper lobe, so presumably had an infectious pneumonia. But what's interesting is there's that pleural collection, but now there's a sliver of fluid medial or deep to the, what looks like calcified visceral pleura. So yeah. the only thing I, and it's well, and it's well demarcated with the lung. So what I think this actually is, is this is the visceral pleura here. And this is sort of a rind of fibrous tissue and that, that, that this liquid is accumulated between the visceral pleura and this medial aspect of the rind, as opposed to this actually being visceral pleura. That's the only explanation I can have for this. Right, so the, pri the parietal pleura just has two layers of calcification, and all of that fluid is just within the... Right, or so, which was... Then, then the strange thing, of course, is if you go back to the original, the earlier scan, is this is must be... Where is... I mean, what's parietal... I mean, you can see the pleural thickening, right? I mean, it only... And the lung abuts this surface. It looks like it's visceral and parietal pleural thickening and calcification with a, a chronic effusion trapped in between. But clearly, that is not the case. Yeah, it's almost like a separate fluid compartment is developed internal. Yeah. That's that like is this so is a peel or something, and there's there and there because clearly this is a, a lung pleural interface right there. It's too smooth not to be. Yes. If you scroll even further down, you can see. If I remember, it's quite. Yeah, it almost looks like there's an extra layer yeah, right there. Yeah, it's like an extra layer, layer. Like a double pleural space. Yeah. Uh, it's just kind so, of cool. Right, because it's almost like right there you're showing what looks like a calcified split pleura sign, but in reality it's all part of the parietal pleura. Right. It's just that yeah. whole tissue plane is enough. And it also has a nice example of hypertrophy, the extra pleural fat, which reflects the chronicity of this process. Yep. There's even asymmetry because there's more there was more inflammation on the left. Okay, that's so what this I thought, patient, yeah. Uh, I'll, this I'm patient sorry. has asbestos as well, or what it, or this is just known the, asbestos exposure. Yeah. No asbestosis, but these are these are definitely pleural plaques, but has diffuse pleural thickening on top of it. Right. Which is this is also a very nice example of where the it's you see plaque, but you also see this this just too much pleural thickening. Very peculiar. Yeah. Um are you, are you Howard, you're done, right? Yes. All right, I've got a couple more cases. Um this is one, unfortunately, I don't have a radiograph of. It would be really cute, but we've, this is something we've talked about so much, I just thought I'd have to share it. So uh, this is a nice scimitar syndrome. You can see there's the big vein coming into the IVC, right right at the right atrium, just at the junction there, and you can see there's, there's an increased flow into the right atrium. Um, but this one's kind of cool because you've got, here's the right upper lobe, and you can see it just kind of has one segment. And then you've got the bronchus intermedius, and then you have a middle lobe and a lower lobe that seems to be missing the superior segment, but then gives off this funny branch that goes deep or anterior to the fissure. So it gives off like a, a third, third portion of the middle lobe down here. And then you can see this funny septum going in, but I've got a, a pretty 3d that shows the nice scimitar vein. You can actually see there's a second branch. It looks like they uh, kind of all come into there into this one That's trunk. Really yeah, I would love a radiograph, but we don't have one. If we look beneath the diaphragm, I'm curious, can we spot any systemic arterial supply coming up from celiac axis or I anywhere? Don't, in the I don't see one. Sometimes they can be really small, right. hard to see. But usually the lung, you see big vessels in the lung because you have these huge big pressures coming in. But this is kind of cool because the scimitar vein itself is rather short. And there's even looks like there's a stenosis right where it comes in, but it has these three branches that come in pretty quickly. But um, and then yeah. you see there's no there's no pulmonary veins on the right, so it drains the entirety of the lung. Okay. But the lung isn't particularly that hypoplastic. It's a little small, but not not usual. But I, what I've come to the conclusion is I think of all the scimitars we've collected, I don't think any two have looked alike. <laughs> oh, agree. So that was a fun one. I hadn't seen a good one in a while. And it's been a while since we've we've had one. Yeah. 
And then this is just a, this is something we've talked about before, but this was a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension. And um, I was just asked about the lungs and, you know, as far as the workup's gone, there's been no shunt or anything. So it's presumably uh, an idiopathic, but it's got a nice example of this sort of heterogeneity you see in these patients where you get this sort of these smudgy ground glass, almost nodules, and they're often around vessels. And I think we've probably, I know we've talked about this before, like, what are these? Are they, you know, cholesterol granulomas? Are they plexiform lesions or both or all the above kind of thing? But uh, I think we see, I see, I've seen this in, in scleroderma with really bad pH too. You just get this smudgy ground glass. And I think this is some of the, what gets called mosaic attenuation, but it's really not because it's not really entire lobules, but rather just little areas in that. And if you do a MIP, you can kind of see just how big some of these vessels are. And then you see this, sometimes the smudgy stuff kind of comes out, you can make it out. And, you know, some of these almost become like telangiectatic vessels. Look at this one here. It, yeah. it gets all corkscrewy, this, but these are not AVMs. These are just, it's just purely bad pH. Yeah, I think you those know, ground glass opacities do represent a form of neovascularity, but they're, they're, the vessels are very, very small. Right. And they're located in the lung, in the interalveolar septa. They're different from the plexiform lesions. Mm -hmm. but in some articles, they're described as the neovascularity, yeah. or in the spectrum, the neovascularity of pulmonary hypertension that's severe. Yeah, I mean, look look here in the middle lobe inferiorly. You've got these beautiful corkscrewing arteries going right towards the pleural yeah. surface. Yeah, yeah that's a nice, pretty normal good. draining vein. You know, one one thing to add too, because I know we've had this discussion, but I, I've talked with Brett Elliker about this too. And sometimes when we see cases, for example, of severe constricted bronchiolitis, where it almost looks like the normally perfused areas have ground glass attenuation, because mm -hmm. it's like it's almost like all the blood is shunted to those areas. He wonders too if some of this is just regional perfusion that at the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule, you just have a lot more blood flow. Mm -hmm. and it, it clamps down at the periphery because these are more central ovular ground glass. So like, yeah. that's kind of his idea that it's probably, it may be perfusional in just that you have the, you know, much more blood at the center of the, the lobules than you do in the periphery of them. Just but, on a smaller scale than you see with CTEF where you get like regions of lung that are ground glassy from over perfusion. Right, exactly. Okay, so, I like that. I, I don't, I like that. I, I like that theory too. I think it's probably, you know, a combination of all of them, but. Cool. All right. Well, that yeah, Jeff. If you if you um, hold on a second, if you just let me show my screen, I'm going to show you this one article that that talks about the neovascularity in the context of Eisenmenger syndrome. But this one has the same kind of thing. They were trying to determine what these foci of little just small areas of ground glass attenuation are in the lungs and they basically try to do radiologic pathologic correlation for the small ground glass attenuating things and then they show slides like this right here and they show these strange vessels in the lungs so they try to basically say that's what we might be seeing mm. as you see there oh that's really helpful howard so yeah, with, they, with what you're they, showing in the article on the in the images looks like what I was showing. Kind of, yeah. So they use the term neovascularity to describe these strange vessels. So you can see they just describe them as markedly dilated congested capillaries, vascular lesions, dilated capillaries in the adventitial tissue surrounding a muscular pulmonary artery, uh, differ distinctly from plexiform lesions in pulmonary hypertension. That's the only article I know of where they try to do a rad path correlation for these small, smudgy, ground glass attenuating opacities. Different from the corkscrew vessels, which someone has called Sheehan vessels, uh, they show some of those. And I, I noticed that the guy that's the first author is Sheehan. So that's what I think your patient has, has that abnormal vascularity similar to what they show in this particular image, these four examples. Excellent. Thank you. That's, that's a nice article. Yeah, that makes sense. And you, you can see, you could see why you would get the, the kind of remodeling of the vessels because there's, you know, some of the, the images there was, looks like there was muscular hypertrophy or intimal thickening and something like that, that a right there, it's got a really thick wall.
Yeah, something like that. All right. Well, thank you. All right.